Leon Panetta 2024 Lecture Series, 2024 and the Challenges to Democracy at Home and Abroad. This lecture discusses the challenge of immigration, reform or chaos in 2024. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sylvia Panetta. Good evening, everybody. How nice to see all of you. And it's with great pleasure that I welcome all of you to the second event of this year's Leon Panetta Lecture Series, live here in Leon's hometown of Monterey at the wonderful Monterey Conference Center. This evening, we continue the discussion of the challenges facing our democracy at home and abroad. And tonight's topic is one that is of personal significance to both Leon and me. Our families came to America to build a better life for their children. Because of their courage, Leon and I were able to live the American dream. I'm sure the same is true for many, if not some of you, in our audience. Today, this promise has turned into a crisis. War, violence, instability, human rights abuses, poverty, and natural disasters in Central and South America, Africa, China, and Russia have brought an unprecedented number of migrants to the southern border. In the month of December 2023 alone, Border Patrol agents recorded 302,000 migrants, a new high. The volume of migration is stra straining the entire capacity of the immigration system and political divisions in Congress have led to an unwillingness to consider reforms. How can we reduce the number of migrants arriving while also adhering to America's legal and humanitarian responsibilities? How can we protect our national security and still give everyone a chance at the American dream? Leon will pose these questions with four experts who understand this issue from the city and state level to the federal cabinet. Our first guest has distinguished himself as a strong leader and successful public servant for nearly two decades. A former mayor of the city of San Antonio from 2009 to 2014, he served as the 16th Secretary of Housing and Urban Development under President Barack Obama from 2014 to 2017. As mayor of America's seventh largest city, he brought a strong focus to expanding educational achievement and making San Antonio a leader in the 21st century global economy. Immigration reform was a key element in his campaign for the 2020 Democratic nomination for president. So please welcome Julian Castro. Our second guest's career in public service began when President Ronald Reagan appointed him as the youngest U.S. attorney in the nation for the Western District of Arkansas. Then in 1996, he won the first of three consecutive terms in the U.S. House of Representatives. During his third term in Congress, President George W. Bush appointed him to serve as administrator of the Drug Enforcement Administration and later as the nation's first undersecretary of Homeland Security for Border Protection. In 2015, he was elected as the 46th governor of the state of Arkansas. In 2018, he was reelected with 65% of the vote, having received more votes than any other Republican candidate for governor in the state's history. 
So please welcome Asa Hutchinson. Our next guest served as U.S. Attorney for the District of Arizona from 1993 to 1997, Attorney General from 1998 to 2003, and was elected the 21st Governor of Arizona in 1998. She served as Governor until 2009 when she left office to become Secretary of Homeland Security in the Obama Administration. As Secretary of Homeland Security, she led the nation's efforts to prevent terrorist attacks, secure its borders, respond to natural disasters, and build domestic resiliency. She oversaw critical enhancements to aviation security, including initiatives like the creation of the TSA PreCheck. She also spearheaded the creation of, da of the DACA initiative, creating hope and relief for thousands of undocumented young people across the nation. She was the first woman and is to date the longest serving Secretary of Homeland Security. In 2013, she was named President of the University of California and served in that position until 2020. She is a recipient of the Panetta Institute's Jefferson Lincoln Award and a strong supporter of our programs. Please welcome Secretary Janet Napolitano. Our fourth guest served as the 47th Governor of Texas from 2000 to 2015. As the longest serving governor of the Lone Star State, he championed conservative pro-growth principles that made Texas the world's 12th largest economy. During his time in Austin, he also implemented transformative reforms in the areas of security, criminal justice reform, energy, education, healthcare, and the economy. He believes defending the border is a constitutional obligation, but has warned against inflammatory rhetoric that divides the nation. In 2017, he was sworn in as the 14th U.S. Secretary of Energy. Under his leadership, the nation ushered in a historic energy area, era, becoming the number one producer of oil and gas in the world a world leader in renewable energy, the dominant global force in supercomputing, quantum computing, and artificial intelligence. Please welcome Secretary Rick Perry. Moderating our discussion is the man who created this lecture series, the former United States Representative for this district, and the former Director of the CIA and Secretary of Defense. He understands the importance of national security and the promise of the Statue of Liberty that we all should be able to live the American dream. Please welcome Leon Panetta. Thank you, and uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, welcome to this is our second forum of the 2024 Panetta Lecture Series. And the overall theme is 2024 and the challenges to our democracy at home and abroad. I think it's fair to say that one of the most difficult challenges facing our democracy today is immigration. And in particular, the failure of both political parties to be able to come to an agreement 
on a solution to this current crisis. It's been three decades since the Congress passed comprehensive immigration reform in 1986. And I know, because I was a part of those negotiations at the time, that led to bipartisan reform during the Reagan administration. We increased border enforcement, provided H-2A and H-2B visas for agricultural and non-agricultural workers. We implemented penalties for employers who knowingly hired unauthorized immigrants. And we provided legal status to the unauthorized immigrants who had lived in the United States for at least five years. That was truly comprehensive reform. Today, our immigration system is without question badly broken, particularly at the border. It's become a very divisive political issue. And yet, it remains a basic fact that the United States of America is a land of immigrants. I'm the son of Italian immigrants who came through Ellis Island and saw the promise on the Statue of Liberty. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Tonight, we'll discuss with our distinguished speakers whether America will work together to stand by that promise or allow our divisions to undermine the American dream. Let me begin by kind of you know, shaping what all of us know is uh, the United States uh, and the immigration that we've had over the centuries. It's affected us demographically, economically, culturally, socially, politically. Uh, we've had several waves of immigration that have made us uh, the land of immigrants. All of you know politics. You've been involved in politics firsthand. And you know the polarization and dysfunction that we currently have in Washington. My question is, can, is it possible for us to get a bipartisan consensus that could help fix immigration? There was a bipartisan deal that was made in the Senate uh, with Senator Langford that didn't go anywhere because of the politics of the moment. Can we get that kind of bipartisan consensus, or are we facing a situation where the politics of division will destroy any hope of compromise now and in November as well, and perhaps beyond? Julian, what do you think? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for the chance to be here. And I, I wish that I had uh, a more optimistic view, at least from now through November. Uh, I think the best chance that we had was the legislation that was recently put forward and that got through the Senate but uh, did not make it. That represented uh, you know, a, a bipartisan attempt to compromise on some of the most hot button issues regarding the border. Uh, and I just think that uh, between now and November, this issue, more than any other issue out there, is tied up in politics. And so there's a lot of gamesmanship. I think, uh, you know, frankly, that uh, former President Trump uh, uh, believes that there's a greater political reward in keeping this alive as an issue through November. And Republicans in the House especially acted on that. So I don't see much of an opportunity to get anything done between now and, and November. I think after November, perhaps, after the voters speak, uh, and it's a new term in Congress, then maybe there will be a chance either to get something comprehensive done or more likely something that is uh, more narrow but works on some of the most pressing issues around immigration. Asa? Well, I just finished campaigning across uh, the country and uh, let me assure you, it's not just a political issue, it is a real issue for Americans. Uh, they're concerned about it, it impacts their cities, their communities, and obviously uh, when you're looking at immigrants, it, it involves the heart of America as well. My daughter-in-law was born in Chihuahua, Mexico, and so I understand it from the immigrant perspective. Uh, and whenever you look at 
the opportunity that we had to pass really a border enforcement bill. I mean, we talked about comprehensive immigration plan. This was actually a border security bill, which is what the Republicans had been wanting all along. And I have a high regard for Senator Lankford, my neighbor in Oklahoma. There's not anyone that's a greater conservative that is more thoughtful about this. And he negotiated with the White House and with Democrat uh, members of the Senate uh, this bipartisan bill, but it was an enforcement bill. It passed the Senate, and that was when it failed in the House. It was not brought up for a vote. It was probably the last opportunity for a political solution to that this year. Now, it remains an issue. It's just that it's an issue without the solution. I think what you'll see is President Biden driving hard, uh, trying to solve this challenge before the election because it impacts politically as well as it's a real problem and nothing else has worked. Uh, but obviously, uh, former President Trump's going to be driving that as an issue and people in America see it as a real issue. And so I do. there are solutions. It can be fixed. We are a great country. Uh, and we can balance the great need for compassion and immigrants in our country with respecting the rule of law that's critical to our country as well. Janet? So I was secretary in 2013 when the Senate passed a comprehensive immigration reform bill uh, with 68 votes. Um, it went to the House and died. Never got a vote. I don't think it was even referred to committee. Um, then we had this year when there was a truly bipartisan border enforcement bill, not a comprehensive bill, but it was a border enforcement bill. Um, it passed the Senate and went to the House and died. Um, I, I think the chances of any legislation in the immigration area passing before the presidential election in November are zero and none. Um, but I do think the president would be well served by taking uh, whatever executive actions he can take, particularly as we can anticipate that as the season changes, the traffic will increase at the southern border. Um, and so to try to stay ahead of that as much as uh, the administration can, take executive action as much as he can, and then keep pounding on the fact that there was one reason and one reason only that uh, the bipartisan bill did not pass, and that was uh, the lack of will amongst the Republicans in the House. And okay, Rick. I think we're probably one of the few things that we can all <laughs> say that we agree on is there is no chance. I think I said earlier today that Jesus will come back before this passes uh, <laughs> and, uh, before the election. But the point is that um, we're a half a loaf is better than no loaf. We talked about that as well from a legislative standpoint. Uh, this is a bill that I think all of us, if we were members of Congress, we would have voted for because it helped move the ball forward. And that's what um, legislative work is supposed to be about, moving the ball forward. Uh, they had the opportunity to. They failed. Uh, that's on them. And uh, I think we as citizens need to express our uh, great concern that we had an opportunity, you didn't take it, and we're watching. Okay, let's a uh, little history here. Prior to 1875, the U.S. admitted virtually all immigrants. Uh, limits uh, then were imposed, first on convicts, lunatics, and idiots. <laughs> My sense is we did so some a of the very good job on yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, uh. idiots. Uh, uh. Uh, we went to a quota system. We went to a preference system. We allowed refugees and asylees. Uh, we basically focused on three areas, family unification, jobs and employment, and humanitarian protection. Uh, and then after 9-11, obviously, on national security concerns. Uh, Janet, are those the right areas that we should continue uh, to have uh, for immigration, or should we be imposing more limitations? No, I think those are generally the right areas. Uh, family unification, um, the, the, the question there is how broadly we define the family. Uh, 
who can qualify to come in as a family member, uh, economic uh, uh, immigration. We need workers uh, for our economy to grow and to thrive. That's how the U.S. economy has grown historically. That's how it will continue to grow. And we need them at all levels of the uh, economy, from uh, the, the high-tech, uh, highly educated workers to uh, workers who are doing construction and working in the fields, et cetera, all, all the way up and down the economy. Uh, and then uh, uh, humanitarian parole uh, uh, for people fleeing from egregious circumstances in their country of origin. Uh, that is a, uh, a source of um, uh, American values, that we can, we can be a safe harbor uh, for uh, folks who are really living in egregious circumstances. Uh, for example, uh, we've used it historically for places like Haiti after the earthquake. Um, so uh, to me, those are the right uh, categories. Uh, and then, of course, national security, that, that kind of comes at it from a different issue, which is to say, uh, what kind of immigration policy do we have that furthers our national security, and what kind of policy must we have to protect our national security? Right. Any, any other comments on that? Uh, I would make two adjustments to the current uh, fabric of our immigration policy. Uh, one, the family re reunification is an important priority, but as you alluded to, that can shrink. It, it really applies to extended family members, and I think that uh, could uh, be narrowed. Second part of it would be uh, that I would advocate for a state-based visa program. You know, the federal government allocates to employers the ability to uh, issue visas to workers that they need. No one knows it better than the governor of the state. The states know whether you need ag workers there, whether you need biotech workers, whether you need health care workers. Allocate to the states the ability to have a state-based visa program for their own economic needs, that partnership with the federal and state government, I think would serve our country well. We, we talked about uh, uh, the issue of uh, the border deal that, or, that was made, uh, but it went nowhere. And we've also talked about the importance of comprehensive reform, uh, and that doesn't appear to be going anywhere. Uh, let, me, let me just ask all of you, do we have to choose between fixing the border and comprehensive reform, or can we do both? Julian? I mean, I, I would hope that we can do both. One of my disappointments with the, with the latest um, piece of legislation was that it didn't include, for instance, dreamers, I mean, who have been waiting now for so many years, uh, and every political cycle, every term, they think that something is going to get done, and this is probably the the lowest hanging fruit, so to speak, with regard to people who are here, part of the 11 to 12 million. I think that we can do both. Um, I think there's a lot of energy right now, of course, around border security and what needs to happen there, resource investments and other changes in policy. But I don't want us to forget about the people, especially dreamers who have been here, who are creating the forward progress along with so many other folks of our economy. And so I hope that we can do both. Rick, what do you think? Well, you, you can secure the border. I mean, we've been dealing with this. Janet and I were just talking about uh, earlier in 2010, she was the Secretary of Homeland Security. I was the governor. I met uh, with uh, uh, President Obama on a tarmac, gave him a letter asking him for 1,000 um, National Guard troops that we needed on, on the Texas border. We know how to secure the border. I mean, literally, you know how to secure the border. There is some amount of, of uh, barrier that you can put up. There are technologies that you can use. There are fast response teams. You can secure the border. It, it can be done. It's just a matter of the will. Uh, you know, there's some of us on the uh, right hand of the political uh, aisle that thinks there's just not the desire uh, to really go do what you need to do to secure the border. And the numbers, you know, it's pretty hard to, uh, it's pretty hard to defend that uh, uh, Washington, D.C. is doing everything that it can. It should not be the state's responsibility to secure the border, but if the federal government's going to fail in doing it, 
I'm not going to criticize a governor for doing everything they can to make sure that their people are being uh, kept safe. Now, uh, let, me, let me ask you about that, as long as you, you raised it. Uh, obviously, Governor Abbott uh, uh, has proposed a number of things w related to uh, uh, dealing with uh, those crossing the border. Uh, lately, he passed uh, SB4, I believe it yep. is, which would allow local law enforcement to be able to arrest those that are suspected of being unauthorized. Yeah. Uh, the Supreme Court took it up, uh, seemed to give it an okay, but then there, uh, the appeals court, Lower court. Uh, took it yeah. under consideration yeah. and had a hearing, uh, and we don't know what the result of that yeah. is gonna be. Uh, we know that the federal government, uh, under the Supremacy Clause, has the primary responsibility to deal with immigration for good reason because it involves dealing with other countries, et cetera. But when it's obvious that they are failing to do everything necessary to try to deal with this issue for whatever reason, uh, then what do governors, and particularly now cities, what are they to do yeah. in this situation? Yeah. Janet? Well. It First of all, I think that uh, um, in, 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 in hope and anticipate that when the Supreme Court ultimately gets SB4 before it, it will be held to violate the Constitution uh, for a number of reasons, violation of the Supremacy Clause, but also just the illogic. One of the things you can do under SB4 is if they find somebody in the country, the state officer finds somebody in the country unlawfully, uh, the state can deport them. Well. That's one state. What happens if the same person's in another state and they have a different policy and then a different policy? Well, what's a foreign country to do? Um, you need one uniform, consistent federal policy as to who is entitled to be in the country under law and who is not entitled to be in the country under law, not a state-by-state -state determination. That is different, by the way, as of from having a state-based visa system, uh, uh, which I think has something to co commend uh, to it. Um, I, you know, I think really what, what the president needs to do is to show he's got a border control plan that involves manpower, that involves technology and sensors, uh, that involves air cover over the border, uh, that involves in appropriate places physical infrastructure um, where it makes strategic sense. Uh, and that there is a plan, uh, and that he has mobilized uh, and cross-designated from other agencies of the federal government to come down and help support uh, those border enforcement efforts. He needs to show that it is a whole of government effort here uh, to, to make sure that the border is as safe as it can be and as secure as it can be. Now, realizing and uh, there's a little moment of reality here. It's a 1,940-mile border, um, and it goes across a variety of terrains and geography and, and, and so forth. The notion that you're going to get 100% sealing of the border is unrealistic. Um, that, that is not uh, an attainable goal. But an attainable goal is showing that you have established order at the border. Uh, and that there is a lawful way to come in, there's a lawful way to apply for asylum, there's a lawful way to come through ports of entry, et cetera, uh, but not to cross unlawfully between the ports. Asa? I agree with much of almost everything that uh, Secretary Napolitano had to articulate there. I would add that the partnership with the states is important. And we've had in uh, this administration, uh, we've had, uh, you know, the governors take steps and they're sued by the federal government saying you don't have the authority to do that. And you've got a conflict uh, in terms of border security when we ought to be working together. And so it's a whole of government approach, but we need to bring the governors along the same path uh, with the same desire to secure the border. I know there's political differences there, and it's been misused uh, by, as a political tool. You know, leadership, though, can overlook that and say, I'm gonna be bigger than that, and we're going to have to work together 
versus getting into litigation constantly on that point. And so, to me, the states are a critical element, as they always have been, uh, in helping the federal government get the job done. Julian, you were a mayor of uh, San Antonio. Uh, what, do you, what do you say to, you know, mayor of New York City, Chicago, Denver, the cities that are, uh, you know, now under tremendous pressure from those uh, immigrants who are being shipped up to these different cities? How, what, what can be done to try to provide some relief in that situation? Well, I think first I'd say that I understand the concern, you know, when they, they talk about uh, the strain on budgets, for instance. Um, obviously, in places like Chicago, the influx of, of people has created strain in the relation, in, in among residents of the city. Uh, so I would say there's several things that can be done. The federal government has to do its job, uh, and my hope is that, that in Congress, they will provide the administration ultimately with the resources to do that, uh, whether it's directly at the border or in some of these other ways. Also, authority, for instance, for uh, people to be able to work more quickly, which is a big problem right now. You have too many people that are not able to work right away. Um, in addition to that, dollars to these communities where migrants have ended up for better coordination to be able to provide basic services to them. Uh, the third thing I would say is just give the example of my hometown of San Antonio. What San Antonio did uh, is start a migrant resource center, which is a one-stop center for the different charitable organizations, governmental organizations, and private companies that are there to offer resources to migrants that come through there to try and, and, and ease their integration into the community so that you have less of these flare-ups, uh, so that people who are gonna get on their way to somewhere else can do that, but people who are gonna stay there in the community can live as harmoniously as possible. Uh, I think if you do those things um, in conjunction with the federal government being able to address the issue at the border, then we can have a much better situation than we have today. Um, what I hope that we don't forget, and what we cannot forget during these times, even when you see a, a a strong wave of people coming is you can't abandon your values. You cannot out of fear or um, bias or any other reason jettison the values that, that we've built and are trying to build the country on. And so it's a matter of striking that balance. Uh, and, and I think that's what we're struggling with right now. Uh, Rick, uh, you know, it, it's obvious that we're talking about uh, a global problem in terms of what's happening uh, with immigration. I mean, the numbers uh, have multiplied. Uh, I think I saw a number that in December of 2023, uh, I think there were something like almost 302,000 uh, encounters, uh, when normally there'd be only about 39,000. Mm -hmm. So this thing has multiplied uh, strongly. Now, you know, we've had wars, we've had violence, we've had instability, we've had human rights abuses, we've had natural disasters, uh, we've had economic spirals, Cuba, Haiti, Nicaragua, Venezuela, instability in China, India, Russia, Turkey, African countries. So there are huge numbers of people who are now making their way uh, to our country. What? What does the United States have to do to address the root causes of what we're seeing in terms of immigration? So it, it may be time for us to uh, really throw some jello at the wall, so to speak, to see what sticks. Uh, because it's pretty clear to me that what we have been doing uh, is not working. Um, you, know, you look at the numbers, you look at the chaos on the border, I mean, literally just within the last week, some of the uh, film clips that we've seen where, you know, people are rushing the border, they're attacking uh, the people who are there to, uh, to uh, defend the border. I mean, th th this is out of hand. And, uh, Governor, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I wish we could wave a magic wand on what you just laid out and said, if the administration would do these things, because I think 
all of us would agree that if those things were to go into place, this border issue would be addressed. But I just don't think the will's there to do that. And I think that's what's missing out of this is the will in Washington, D.C. When, you know, it, I didn't run into these problems when I was the governor. You know, I, I met with President Obama. He didn't do everything I asked him to do, but he was, you know, he, he, he worked with us uh, to, to some degree. And I just don't see that out of this administration. And we've got we've to get over being, you know, I'm not going to help you because you're a, a Democrat or I'm not going to help you because you're a Republican and, and start working on these issues as, as Americans. And this is an American issue. And at some point in time, if we don't get this border under control, we're going to have some events in this country that are going to be devastating. And it's going to be because we did not do our job. And I'm talking about we as the collective whole here uh, in Washington, D.C., and or in the states, and finding ways to work together. So, um, you know, I'm, I, I'm really concerned that we're losing the will to work together and that, that Washington really needs to get their act together. And we, the people, need to let them know we're not happy. Let's, uh, let, in line with that, let's talk about the asylum crisis. Uh, you've got a, a huge number of migrants uh, that are now claiming asylum. Uh, if they can establish what's called credible fear uh, of persecution, uh, in their home countries, and, and they may be p paroled, which uh, means that they're allowed to stay here temporarily. The problem is immigration courts have a huge backlog of more than three million cases. It takes four years to be able to hear a case on asylum, four years. Uh, and there's only, I guess, about 682 immigration judges uh, that are dealing with this. What changes need to be made on the asylum process uh, to try to deal with this crisis. Janet? Well, one thing um, I think should be considered is uh, uh, detailing 2,000 people from other federal agencies. Uh, give, them some, give them six weeks, two months worth of training to be asylum officers and detail them to the border to, so that cases that are coming in are dealt with expeditiously, allowing ex the existing immigration courts and judges to start clearing the backlog. Um, and, and by doing that, dealing with the, the most recent ones, um, and then uh, focusing on clearing the backlog, trying to get into regular order uh, with how those cases are processed, that needs to be processed efficiently, fairly, and effectively. People are entitled to claim asylum. They're entitled to have that matter be heard. They're not automatically entitled to asylum if they can't meet the requisite burden of proof. So let's let's get that system uh, uh, figured out and, and going. And that's, you know, detailing 2,000 employees from other government agencies down the border sounds like an easy thing to do. As you know, administratively, it's a it's a yeah. it's a hassle. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the kind of thing that needs to be done and, and illustrates what I I would call a whole of government approach. Asa, you were there, and uh, the bureaucracy, and what, what do you, how do you deal with this kind of problem? Well, you described it well as to uh, the processing through our immigration courts. I actually went to immigration court uh, to see how it operated and see the judge, and afterwards I met with the judge, and he looked at me, he said, Asa, the case is never over until the immigrant wins. <laughs> and, uh, and he was expressing his frustration uh, with the endless appeals, with the endless appeals. And we need to put the resources, as Janet said, whether you new resources or you allocate them from other agencies, to quickly process those cases and decisions that are made on them. Uh, and, you know, if they don't qualify for asylum, and then you can move them back to their country. If they do qualify, then let them in. Uh, this administration, uh, very late in the process, I wish they had done it a long time ago, uh, but they have a new rule in place that says uh, that if you're going to claim asylum, you ought to go to a port of entry to do it, rather than Russian in the middle 
uh, between the ports of entry. The second thing is, if you're from, from uh, Venezuela and you cross through multiple countries uh, and then try to claim asylum in the United States, you should be denied because you didn't claim asylum in those countries you're going through. And so those are the kind of substantive reforms with resource allocations that can actually make the system work well. So that we can give those that are legitimate asylum seekers relief and then we can at the same time turn those back that don't qualify. Julia? Well, I mean, I think that, that the biggest challenge we have uh, and what needs the most work is to, is to, as Secretary Napolitano said, deliver the resources to actually process people's asylum applications more quickly. I think that would go a long way to solving this challenge uh, the problem is that the administration that has asked for those resources has not been granted those resources by Republicans in Congress. And they've asked for those resources repeatedly, including in this last compromise piece of legislation. What I don't think that we should do is change the credible fear standard. Uh, because something that you know, we brought up earlier is important here and, and that you alluded to, Secretary, which is that the vast majority of people who request asylum don't actually get it in the United States. So even with these higher numbers, you're not going to have the same flood of people that are actually getting asylum in the country. You have a lot more people requesting asylum now. You need to be able to, to filter through those, adjudicate those requests and act accordingly. If people qualify for asylum to get it and everybody who does not to be on their way as, as quickly as possible, it makes sense for everybody. Um, but what I don't think that we should do is change our values and completely rewrite uh, these laws that we've stood by for generations. And just remember also what's on the other side of this. What's on the other side of this is not some even-keeled, even-handed sort of fair sense of who's going to get asylum or not. What's on the other side of this is what we saw for those four years of the Trump administration of family separation of this language that the former president is now using about calling uh, uh, migrants animals and saying that they're questioning whether they can be consider considered humans. So in a very real way, there is a choice to make about which way we want to go. And I don't think that we should go in that direction. Yeah. Rick. I, I don't have anything to add on this. I think this is nibbling around the edges. Uh, until you deal with whether or not you're going to get the border secure, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, um, you know, exercise, but I don't think it has any real effect on what we really need to be focused on, and that is the security of that southern border. Until you get that done, all of these other things, uh, you are literally fiddling while Rome is burning. Well, uh, le let me ask about one thing that uh, is very concerning, which is the kind of the border patrol crisis, uh, because enforcement is overwhelmed. Uh, as I said, uh, record high of almost 3.2 million encounters in 2023. Uh, it's been difficult to hire additional agents. Uh, Trump wanted to hire additional agents. Biden's wanted to hire additional agents. Uh, and what we're finding is that they've got to go through extensive background checks, which makes sense because you're dealing with national security threats, so you don't want to have somebody who's questionable. Lie detector tests, 65% have failed the lie detector tests that uh, have been provided. Uh, and they have to compete, obviously, with other federal law enforcement organizations. And now there's fear that there's going to be an upsurge in retirements uh, for the uh, Border Patrol. What, what will it take to hire the additional Border Patrol agents that are so needed? Janet, you're familiar with Money. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, being able to provide uh, uh, different kinds of service credits and bonus payments and other things to people who will serve in the Border Patrol and give people an incentive. It's very hard work and it's in many places it's really hard uh, physical circumstances. Um, and uh, 
Um, and so I think anything you can do to incentivize people uh, to have a career in the Border Patrol, it's a good career. I mean, you can advance, uh, you become a, you're a field agent, then you become a station chief, et cetera, et cetera. But um, uh, making it uh, a more fulsome federal law enforcement career, I think, would help. Asa, you've dealt with law enforcement. Well, nothing is more important in terms of recruiting law enforcement than to uh, improve morale, to make sure they understand that uh, the political side has their back and support them in their effort. And that's important for the Border Patrol. They need to know that we stand with them, that we appreciate their work, and it's valued. Uh, whenever you look at uh, my service at Homeland Security, Many years ago, we had 11,000 Border Patrol agents. I believe today we have 20,000. So we've increased those numbers dramatically. And while I, I think we need to back them up, we need to hire more, uh, I think it's just as important to hire the uh, uh, asylum officers, uh, the uh, immigration uh, officials that can process cases. Indeed. I think that's what the Border Patrol would like to see as well. Uh, uh, and, and then you've got to make sure that the policy helps them. Uh, they see this as something that uh, America can fix and is not fixing. Uh, they know what needs to be done. They, need to know, they know the resources. I think there's technological fixes there. It's more than just the manpower side. And I think they, got to, they have to see the whole approach for that including what we're doing with Mexico and the cartels in order to effectively control the border. And I think that's what uh, the Border Patrol wants mm -hmm. and what will increase them. Rick, you were governor and you ran for president. Uh, what would you do to try to increase Border Patrol? He brings up a really interesting issue, and that is working with Mexico. And I think we have basically failed, uh, and, and, and I'm, I'm not sure anybody uh, has done a good job, with the possible exception going all the way back to George W. Bush and his relationship with Vicente Fox. Uh, I'm not sure any president has had that really good, trusting relationship with a Mexican president that I think it's going to take uh, before we really uh, uh, address this issue with Mexico. And until we have a partner that, that we trust and they trust us, I'm not sure that we can put enough Border Patrol agents on the border. I'm not sure that we can have enough technology. I'm not sure that we can stem this flow. So I, I think that until we get that trusting working relationship. So you ask me, what would I do? I would gather up the whole of the Western Hemisphere and see if we can put together a Western Hemispheric uh, Marshall Plan, a modern day Marshall Plan, where we actually have a, a, an, an effort, I, I know it sounds big and it, it, it's uh, presumptuous maybe, but maybe that's what it's going to take, where these countries that they don't know or care, frankly, whether America uh, cares about them. And maybe all of us working together, we have these conversations with Mexico, with El Salvador, with Guatemala, with right on down. And if the, if the core issue is there's either something they're afraid of or there's economically reasons for them to be leaving their country and, and, and taking this perilous trip, how do we address that in their countries? And maybe that's a step in the right direction. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the problems I'm concerned about is that Latin and Central America has always been kind of a stepchild to the United States, uh, where we, we really haven't paid attention to the issues there. I guess President Kennedy was probably the last one to really focus on the importance of that relationship. Yeah. And I think the more, we, the more we ignore it, the more it blows up on us, yeah. as we as witness what's happening in Haiti right now it's uh you know it it's just trouble but as we were uh, discussing earlier today you know there's an example and that's colombia uh colombia was uh, the, the coke capital of the world it was a huge problem for the united states 
Um, and at the, uh, we work with the president of Colombia, I think at his invitation, and that's an important factor. And we can't, the United States can't just say, we're from the United States and we're here to help. That, that's not gonna work. Uh, it, it, it has to be, uh, uh, there has to be an, an illustration of a desire uh, from, from other countries that. Ac yeah, actually it was a good example. I, uh, I was in the CIA at the time and we had deployed not only our people to Colombia, but we, uh, we also had deployed military yep. trainers yep. Uh, and uh, those who were there fighting right alongside the Colombian yep. forces that were there. Uh, and it really worked pretty effectively. Yep. We did have good cooperation yep. from the president. The governor's, the governor's uh, correct. You've got to have right. the individual president leadership in that country say, we right. need your no, help. That's right. And today, we obviously don't have that with AMLO. Not right. you, you mentioned uh, President Vicente Fox of Mexico. Bush had a good relationship with him. I went down there and met with him. I was head of the DEA. I said, we need your help going after the cartels. Uh, that, that was troubling us just like they are today. He agreed to help. They worked with us. And within, we cross-trained. We shared intelligence. And the Ariana Felix brothers, uh, uh, who ran the Ariana Felix organization, one was captured, one was killed by the Mexican police. And so it can be successful. Right now we have a president of Mexico uh, that is not supporting the United States and diminishing the strength of the cartels. He's given them and empowered them. That has got to change. And as you said, uh, we've got to have a president that builds that relationship uh, and we have to have a willing partner on Mexico's side. Yeah. Okay. Were you going to yeah, say well, that? I was just going to say, I think, I think some of the most promising work that the Biden administration is doing is being led by Vice President Harris down in the Northern Triangle to help ensure that there's greater opportunity there uh, through investment that creates jobs and ultimately better safety so that people can find safety and opportunity at home instead of having to f try and find it here. Okay. We're at uh, more than the halfway point. Uh, what I'd like to do is to take a moment to recognize our question review team, the people who are responsible for selecting the questions that will be presented to our speakers. And I ask you to hold your applause until I introduce the entire group. They are Mike Clancy, who's a reporter with KSQD FM 90.7, David Kellogg, managing editor of the Monterey Herald, Pam Marino, who's a reporter with Monterey County Weekly, and Doug McKnight, who's a reporter with KAZU Radio. Would you give them a hand? Shelby and I also want to thank our Panetta Institute Board of Directors uh, and the lecture series sponsors that make these programs possible and allow us to share these very important discussions with all of you, with our audience that's watching at home, and in particular with the students from across the Central and Northern California. We had a student session with our speakers, and I can't tell you. Uh, you know, how impressed I was with the quality of questions and the interchange that took place with, uh, with the students. So please give our sponsors a hand as well. <laughs> Janet, uh, first question on the DACA program. Uh, you were in the Obama administration at the time that uh, the president uh, took an executive action to try to protect young people who arrived in the U.S. as children. Uh, the uh, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, the DACA program, provided temporary protection for deportation and also work authorization to unauthorized youth. Uh, when I was secretary, I had DACA people who were in the military. Uh, we've had DACA students. I think UC had DACA students as well. Uh, Trump stopped the program, litigation uh, took, took place uh, and allowed it to, to continue, but it continues to be under litigation. What is the future of the DACA program? Well, I think it's, a, it's, a limit, it's limited um, because they're no longer accepting new applicants into the DACA program. And, uh, you know, when we started DACA, uh, back in 2012, it, it was to, 
you know, it was, it was upon the heels of the multiple failures of Congress to pass a DREAM Act. Uh, dreamers, uh, um, they don't call themselves that now, but they then called them, they were called dreamers. They were people, young people brought here, typically at the age of six or younger, who had grown up in the United States, really knew only the United States as home, uh, and, and were going, trying to go to college, trying to get work, trying to be in the military, et cetera. Um, you know, American in every way, except for one thing, is that they were not documented. Um, and it seemed to me at the time, uh, uh, given Congress's failure to fix this issue for this population, that um, this was a time when the executive branch uh, could and should act, and we hatched DACA, um, which is a deferred action program. It doesn't provide any citizenship rights or anything of that sort. Why? Because only Congress can do that. Uh, but it does say that the law enforcement part of the immigration enforcement part of uh, the executive branch is not going to come after you. It, and so that young people could quit having to look around their shoulder to make sure they weren't going to get picked up and so they could get work authorization. Very, very important. When we started it in 2012, we were given 60 days to get it up and running from the time the president announced it in the Rose Garden to day one, um, which is like rocket speed, right? And, uh, but, and we didn't know whether we'd have 50 or 500 or 5,000. Um, we had to develop the forms. We had to train people. We had to um, create a fee structure because we had no, no uh, appropriated money for it, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, but, by the time all was said and done, it, it, when it went into effect, it went very smoothly. Um, and, and at its peak, about 850,000 young people were DACA, um, including thousands at the University of California. Uh, when the Trump administration rescinded the program, the University of California was first plaintiff to sue to stop the rescission. I, I was president then, I think I'm the first cabinet secretary to have actually sued her successor. So, but, you know, um, you, you got to do what you got to do. And, and, um, uh, and, and ultimately, the Supreme Court uh, um, held, held that the administration had not uh, uh, lawfully rescinded the program. But at the same time, there was another piece of litigation wending its way through the ever helpful Fifth Circuit. Uh, and they basically enjoined um, and, and stopped new applicants from being able to grow the program. So everybody in DACA continues to be enrolled. They can renew their enrollment, but it, it's not growing the way that it otherwise could. Yeah. Uh, Rick, uh, how important is immigration to our economy? We have a, a great need for immigrant labor. Uh, in almost all phases and parts of our economy right now, uh, particularly for this area in agriculture, yeah. we I, uh, yeah, have a tremendous need for driving from the airport. Labor. Yeah, you, you saw I them. came through Castroville and I saw <laughs> the sign that said the artichoke capital of the world. And my bet is there's a lot of labor that's needed there. And earlier we talked about, okay, if, if, if comprehensive, um, immigration policy is just too heavy a load for you. How about let's do something simple. Let's have a single shot, kind of rifle shot here, if you will, piece of legislation that allows for workers in the agricultural sector to come in for some time specific period of time. Here's your card that you have to show that you're in the United States legally for this period of time. You come in, you help them do your work, they you know, get a, a good wage and they go home. Why would that not be a good thing? And it's, no, it's not the be all to end all, but it's part of that half a loaf is better than no loaf. Let's make some progress here. Let's come up with some, some ways to find some solutions. We may have to piecemeal this. Uh, we may have to piecemeal it forever with the uh, politics, what we're seeing in Washington currently, but anyway. So um, let's, let's find some solutions. I mean, let's have some wins. <laughs> uh, hey, so I'll, I'll just add, uh, we, we do need 
workers and we, we need uh, skilled laborers. And, you know, we always have a difficult debate in Congress, you know, as to what the allocation is for the employer-based visas. Again, the state-based visa is a good potential solution there. But I want to thank you for uh, uh, the effort for the DACA students. Arkansas is a very conservative state with a very conservative Republican legislature. And we uh, gave licensure uh, access for every DACA student in Arkansas so that they could be a nurse or they could be a plumber. And, and so we need to make sure that they are protected and I hope that uh, we can make that permanent. And, and that may be one of the ways to do it, is state by state, instead of having to sit around here and, and, and wait for, you know, who knew we did that in Texas in 2001. We allowed for uh, young people who showed up in the state of Texas by, not, you know, they had no control of this. They were brought to the United States, brought to the state of Texas as they were young children. And they had done their work. They, uh, they graduated from high school. They had done their work. They went to a Texas college. And we, we, or they were eligible to go to a Texas college. And we made them eligible for in-state tuition. And it passed by, I think, 147 to 3 in the state house. And, and it passed unanimously in the state senate in 2001. And then 10 years later, you would have thought we were dancing with the devil. Um, and, and, and so I, I'm just, you know, it breaks my heart when I think about that you want these kids, they're going to be in the United States. You want them to be successful, and if you don't educate them, they're not going to be as successful as they could be. And so the great message there that came out of Texas, that came out of Arkansas, came out of other states, and so, you know, maybe the challenge is, you know, for the states to, again, the federal government's going to be dysfunctional, maybe the states don't have to be. Julian? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, that, that to a large extent we're kidding ourselves in this country because it's not just folks that come through with visas, but it, it's undocumented workers that are propping up several industries in the United States. And most folks don't want to believe, for some reason, don't want to believe that that's the reality or that, quote unquote, they're taking American jobs or that there would be a flood of Americans that, American citizens that take these jobs if these undocumented immigrants weren't doing them. And certainly there would be some, for sure. Um, but with the vast majority of these jobs, you know, in a 3.5% unemployment rate economy, 3.5%. The country needs these folks. The economy needs these folks. Social Security, the Social Security Fund in the future needs these folks. The fact that, that <coughs> our birth rate in the United States is now falling the way that you've seen in other countries around the world, that in a few years is going to change the nature of this conversation. I think that to answer your, your question, Secretary Panetta, yeah, we absolutely need these, these undocumented immigrants. Uh, and the sooner that we get to, now I'm talking about the folks that are already here, addressing the dreamers and then addressing their parents that were part of DAPA in 2014, and then beyond that, I think uh, the, the stronger that we're gonna be economically in the United States in the long term. Okay, let's... Uh... Let's talk a little politics here. Um, <laughs> We're just starting now. <laughs> uh, Janet and Julian, uh, how would you grade a President Biden's performance on immigration enforcement? And Asa and Rick, uh, obviously, former President Trump has used some strong language uh, in dealing with immigrants, uh, said they're poison in our society. Uh, he's villainized immigrants, promised the largest domestic deportation operation in American history, utilizing the military. Uh, how would you grade uh, his approach to immigration? So let's start with the Democrats. 
<laughs> yeah, no, I'd be happy to start. Look, I mean, folks may know that, that I had my disagreements with President Biden, of course, uh, in the 2020 campaign, and on some of these issues, I was coming at it from a more left position than the president. But I think if you're, if you're talking about how much has the president tried to ensure that, that the laws of the United States are being enforced at the border and tried to summon the resources from Congress to be able to address that, I would give him a strong grade on that. Now, that's a separate question from whether those resources have been allocated because he's not a king. And he works in a political ecosystem where if he can't get the resources from a Congress that is partially controlled by Republicans, then that's not gonna happen. And, and his, in his budgets, in this compromise legislation that Senator Langford and other Republicans worked intimately on uh, from the beginning, there were dollars that were going to be allocated for all of these things that we've been talking about, all of them, for more agents, for more immigration judges, for great, better technology, for better, for better ability to stop fentanyl coming across at ports of entry, all of those things. That was the Biden agenda. Not only that, for those of us on, on the left that didn't like this though, Title 42 remained in place longer than I think a lot of people thought that it would uh, remain in Mexico. These are Trump policies stayed in place longer than a lot of folks wanted it to. Vice President Harris went down to Central America and remember she said she delivered a very clear message of don't come, don't come, don't come. That's what the administration has done. So for folks to argue that somehow this administration has said hey, everybody, the border is open, come across the border, and we're just gonna sit on our hands and not try and do anything about it. They have, the administration has tried to do, do something about it very directly, even gone, you know, in my opinion, on some of these issues more to the right than I'm comfortable with, uh, and, and has sent a clear message to folks that, that you know, they, they should stay home. I don't know what else in that regard and border enforcement that the administration can do. I mean, unless you're talking about separating families and, and putting more razor wire in the Rio Grande River and a, a more militaristic approach where you're either threatening or actually hurting people the way that others have talked about in the Republican Party or what some of them have talked about, invading Mexico. Literally invading Mexico has been one of the talking points. Who's, I mean, so uh, I think that the Biden administration has tried very hard, but because of the political realities that it deals with, has not been able to get the resources for enforcement that folks would like. Janet? So I, 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 I would agree to some uh, degree. Um, not 100%, um, in part because I think uh, from my perspective, the, the Trump approach to immigration was s such a blunt ax. Um, and in so many ways, in terms of the articulation of it, contrary to uh, uh, my values, and I think overall American values, um, that the initial communication from the Biden administration and how it was perceived in the immigrant community was, uh, this is gonna be a 180 degree turn. Uh, and that's how it was perceived. Um, and um, it was not a 180 degree turn, uh, but um, nonetheless, that traffic is very sensitive to messaging. Um, and that was the message that they were perceiving. Um, and I think that um, uh, uh, it would have behooved the Biden administration, and I. I'm a, I'm a Biden supporter, I'll be, I'll be right up front there. And I support the president and I support his agenda. Um, uh, but I would, I would have advised him at the time uh, to be nuanced a little bit in what he said, saying we are going to fix and work with Congress on fixing the American immigration system. Um, and at the same time, we're gonna make smart moves on the border. Um, uh, rather than get, letting the perception be created that every, everything Trump had done was automatically eviscerated and eliminated and gone. Um, 
And, and I think that initial kind of lack of messaging has, has played out over the, over the last uh, few years. Um, and, and it is not itself causal for the increase in traffic. Um, but I think it is related to um, how immigration is polling in the United States and in the presidential race. Okay, let's turn to the other guy. <laughs> Asa, you ran against him, so. Oh, I, I did indeed, and uh, uh, I'd love to grade uh, President Biden, but you asked me to concentrate uh, on uh, President we, Trump. We understand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I ran against uh, President Trump, and uh, most importantly, I think it's critical for reflection of American values that you articulate rhetoric that says the immigrant community and immigrant history of the United States is important to our country. It is important to the fabric of our country, our economy, uh, the vibrancy of our democracy. And at some point in time, that has to be clearly stated by a president of the United States. And so I don't see that in Donald Trump, and that's an incredible omission. And I uh, would give him a terrible grade uh, uh, on the language that he uses about immigrants. And even if they come in here unlawfully, you still do not degrade them from a human standpoint. Now, having said that, that's where he gets his bad grade. But the fact is, uh, the American people are looking to Donald Trump saying he's the only one that can fix the problem now. And it's gonna take somebody that is tough in language uh, it doesn't have to cross the line, but it has to be clear. As you said, the traffickers and the cartels, they listen to the nuance of that language and they magnify it out there. And both from a city standpoint in which we provide services, it's the magnet that draws them in, it's the language that we provide. And so it's gonna take a president that is very clear without any mistake that uh, that border is, not go is going to be different. And uh, I think that slows it down. So obviously Trump's language is awful, uh, but the American public look at him as somebody that can fix it. And I think you see that in the polls right now. So what you're saying is that Donald Trump is not nuanced. <laughs> What, what I'm saying is that I, that I, I could do better than Donald Trump. <laughs> so I happened. So could Rick. I, I, had, I had that. Uh, uh, I had that privilege to uh, uh, run against him as well, and and uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, nobody said any worse things about him than I did when we were running against each other. I think I said that he was a cancer on conservatism. And uh, he reminded me of that on a regular basis in cabinet <laughs> meetings, I might just add. So he doesn't forget very easily. But here, here's what's, you know, I'm a lot less worried about whether or not somebody is nuanced in what they, they say or not. I'm looking at the record. I'm not a process guy. I'm about results. And if the last three years are the result we're gonna be looking at for four more years with the Biden administration, then this is a real easy decision for me. I consider the Biden administration to be an abject failure in dealing with the border. And I think most Americans look at it that way as well. Uh, I can assure you the Hispanic businessman and woman along the border of Texas that historically had voted Democrat their whole life, that if you went and asked them which political party do you belong to, they'll still say they're a Democrat. But they're considering, and in many cases, they're going to vote for Donald Trump because they're looking for somebody who actually knows how to stem the flow, to stop this just outrageous amount of people that are showing up into the United States and they're really scared for their families, they're scared for the future, 
and they're scared for what's going to happen one of these days because the federal government has absolutely failed in its responsibility of defending the southern border of the United States. Uh, Julian, uh, yeah. tell, talk to me a little bit about where, where, are the Latin, where are the Latino voters now? Well, I mean, I think, like, that of course there are some, you know, that are more sympathetic to Trump. I, I, I think it's an overstatement to suggest that Trump is going to win those counties. I think he's going to end up losing most of them. Um, I think the Latino community, y'all probably hear after every election cycle the same word, the same phrase, which is that it's not monolithic, right? How many times have you heard that in the analysis? Uh, which is true. I mean, it, it's been different in different parts of the country for years. Um, I have not seen evidence that either Biden or Trump's position in this cycle on immigration specifically is the cause for the numbers going up and up or down in, in the Latino community. I think people are making a big assumption that somehow Trump talking tougher on immigration is related to his numbers going up by a few points. But there's nothing that I've seen that actually demonstrates that that's the reason. It's just people are drawing this, this there's a correlation here and they're assuming causation. Um, I would say also that the, the, to me, just to back up a little bit, the problem with Trump is not just the rhetoric, it's the policies. Yeah. It's what he actually does. There are several hundred parents who are still separated from their own children right now. That is not rhetoric. That was a cruel policy that was put in place and that people are actually paying for and that was done in the name of the United States, in the name of everybody here. That, that everybody should contend with in their mind when they think about the choice. And so when it comes to something like this, an issue where you know, it's given to emotion and fear, there's another point. Every significant study that's been done shows that legal immigrants and, and undocumented immigrants commit crimes at a lower rate than native-born Americans. And many of these cities that we're talking about, whether it's El Paso or Eagle Pass or Del Rio or Laredo, are some of the safest communities in the state of Texas. And so, you know, there's a, quite a bit of fear-mongering that happens with this issue that I think we have to untangle if we're really being serious and, and trying to make a good policy decision have to untangle before we fall for some of these stereotypes of folks seeking asylum. Uh, so, yeah, I, I hope that folks will keep that in mind as the election cycle goes forward. Let me ask uh, all four of you. Uh, and uh, some of you have run for president of the United States. Uh, we know the depths of this problem. We know the crisis that we're seeing uh, we know the failure, frankly, of both parties to be able to effectively address it for a lot of reasons. Uh, you've, you've just commented on, on some of those reasons. Uh, but let me ask you this. If you were president of the United States, give me the, at least the two or three most important steps you would be taking to deal with this crisis. Rick? Start with you. So in 2011, uh, I laid out a concept. I said that, um, and think about this was 13 years ago. Um, everyone who's coming to the United States, you have uh, one year to go to your consulate or your embassy and register. We take your biometric data. You get a card. You are a legal uh, non-resident alien in the United States. You can stay here and work as long as you want. Every year you come down and you swipe your card. If you paid your taxes, you kept your nose clean, you haven't broken any laws, you get to stay in the United States. If you haven't, you're going to be deported. And we're going to make sure that the border is secure. And put that in place. If you want to become a citizen of the United States, there's a line, go get in and go through that process. Had we done that in 2012, 2013, 
where do you think we would be today? I would suggest to you we would be substantially in better place today if we put a process like that because the issue is we want to know who's coming into the United States and if they have the identification that says yes I can be here and you can stay here as long as you want as long as you live within our laws and you participate properly. The bad guys would never register and sometime in that three, four, five year period of time, they would be identified and they would be deported. And it just, that simple solution, now I'm saying 12 years ago, I don't know whether that works today or not, but the point is we need to know who is coming across the border. I think that's what's the biggest concern about the, the citizens of this, of this country is that we just don't know who's coming in and you know, what's that going to lead to? All right, Janet, uh, you've, you've worked in the administration. You've, you've seen this stuff up close. What would you do? I'd do a couple uh, of things. First, I would take a whole host of administrative actions, many of which we've discussed this evening, uh, and deploying more uh, asylum officers, uh, 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 focus on hiring up on the Border Patrol, uh, explaining to the American people my plan for securing the border, a combination of manpower and technology and air cover and, and, and physical infrastructure at in different places. I'd report to the American people about that. This is what we're doing. We will have and we are striving to have order at the border. And I would just say it again and again and again. We will have order at the border. I would then prepare uh, a series of bills to be introduced in the Congress. They won't pass, uh, but uh, they, 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 sh they, they should. And you've got to start somewhere. But I would uh, have a DREAM Act equivalent. I'd, I'd have uh, a visa reform equivalent. I, I would take on some of those endemic systemic issues in the immigration system and, and say, I'm asking Congress to do this, and then keep talking about it. Don't just do one presser on it, but keep talking about it. Order at the border. Immigration changes uh, to match our immigration needs and to marry with our values. Uh, and then third, um, I would not lose sight of the fact uh, that, as, and, and I know that every president well, the current president and the president I work for have focused on. There's a fundamental tension here. There's a fundamental tension between, on the one hand, wanting having a history as a country of being open to immigration. Uh, give me your, your, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the inscription on the, on the Statue of Liberty, that's, that's one, with the fact that we are a country that is based on the rule of law. Uh, and, and to say, yes, we are a country that has, is, has a huge and rich immigrant history. We have thrived as a country of immigrants. We will thrive as a country of immigrants, but the rule of law cannot be set aside. Um, and that has to be the overlay, and that is what I'm intent on doing. Asa, uh, for, uh, we've got... We've got five minutes left, so let me give a couple minutes to each of you to kind of wrap it up. Well, the first thing I'd do is call Janet in my office and talk to her. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, uh, uh, the convening power and the communication power of the President of the United States has to be utilized. And I would address the nation to tell the American public exactly what's going to be done knowing that those leaders in South America, Central America, and even the cartels are going to know exactly what you say, and they're going to hear the strength of the message that the border is going to be secure. Secondly, I would ask the governors, Democrat and Republican along the border, to come see me. Convene with them and say, we're going to stop suing each other, we're going to work together, and ask their help along that way. Thirdly, uh, I would be in... Mexico, meeting with the President of Mexico and conveying to him we've got to build a stronger partnership. We need your support for the rule of law 
and follow that up with the other Central American companies that we need to build the alliance with. Finally, uh, quite frankly, I'd call the mayors of the major cities together and say we've got to stop providing a sanctuary place in which we send the message that you've got free services if you make your way here. That's got to change. Julian? Yeah, and I know we only have three minutes up. I won't take all three. You get, uh, yeah, I you think get, you get to wrap it up, pal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot of the administrative investments that uh, Secretary Napolitano talked about, I think, make a lot of sense to be able to process people's asylum claims. I would do that without changing the, the credible fear standard, make sure we have the immigration judges we need. Uh, also, of course, uh, enforcement at the border and better technology uh, to detect fentanyl and so forth. Um, in addition to that, in the longer term, work better with Mexico. I think that makes a lot of sense. They are key to helping us stem the flow. And uh, like uh, Governor Perry, I also called for a Marshall Plan. I called for it for Central America when I ran uh, in 2020. Doing that so that people can find safety and opportunity at home instead of having to come here. Uh, and then I'll just say finally one thing that, that we haven't touched on as much. Uh, somebody in leadership and hopefully the president needs to remind folks about the good part of immigration. Hmm. You can't be scared of this issue. The party has been backing up and backing up and backing up and you back yourself into a corner where then you get into a crisis mode and, and have to almost give in in policy to the fear and the paranoia. That's a mistake. And that's a mistake that's gonna be very dangerous to, to immigrants in the future if it keeps up. And so in addition to actually doing these things, the, the rhetoric needs to be different and balanced and talk about the positive and not fear monger. Rick. The, re the reason I wanted to ask that question is because I think it, it really is important to kind of understand that there is a way to fix this problem. Uh, if both parties can work together. Uh, and you've really heard some very good presentations, I think, from each of these speakers about the approach that needs to be taken. I've often said, you know, and I tell the students this at the Panetta Institute, that we govern in our democracy either by leadership or crisis. If leadership is there and willing to take the strong steps necessary for leadership, we can avoid crisis. But when leadership is not there, then we operate by crisis in this country. And today, immigration is one of those crises that uh, doesn't have the leadership that really is necessary in order to be able to deal with it. So I think the message tonight is that we need strong leadership in order not only to deal with immigration, but to deal with the survival of our democracy. Thank you very much for coming tonight. <laughs>